Good morning again, church. It's good to be with everyone here as we conclude our series today on Neighbors and Ourselves. And today we're going to look at what it means to be ourselves as we relate to our neighbors and as we prepare ourselves for that today. I want to invite us to hear from the scriptures from the New Testament, and we're going to be reading from the second letter to Timothy, starting in the third chapter with the 14th verse, through chapter 4, verse 5. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing and His kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. This is the word of God for all of God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we are gathered on this day and in this place, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, who is our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Over these last several weeks, we have been talking about the art of neighboring and how much of who we are as neighbors and as Christians and as followers of Jesus all comes back to the greatest commandment of loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and of loving our neighbors as ourselves. The scripture is very easy to quote. You don't even have to be familiar with the Bible to know it. But it is actually much harder as we are finding to live out. And now more than ever before, that seems to be the case. It's hard to live out not just because of what we face every day, but it is hard to live out because of what truly being a good neighbor means. And it means we have to be true to ourselves and who we are. And that leads to the question, who are we? Well, first and foremost, we are followers of Jesus Christ. We are people who are made in the image of God to reflect and to build the kingdom of God. And while that can be very easy for us to say, it may not be as easy for us to believe. In our passage today, Timothy gets a reminder of who he is and then what he is supposed to do with that. So first he's reminded that he simply needs to be true to himself, especially in the face of adversity. He is reminded from childhood of what he has known and believed all along and how he was instructed in the faith in Jesus Christ, which has not changed. Since he knows this, he can believe this. And then he is encouraged not to shy away from the scriptures that inform his faith are ours. The scriptures at that time here being the Old Testament, but how that scripture was useful for him and how it is useful now for all of us in faith in Jesus, in spite of those who would discard it or contort it for their own purposes. This 
in spite of what we might think, is not easy. And I will admit, in being a good neighbor, it's not easy either, because as we know, we have no shortage of churches around here that help us to find and justify our own faith. Each church has their own version of what that instruction, that correction, that training and reproof is supposed to mean. Sometimes they align, and other times they don't. Just as we've received new members today, I'm always reminded of a cartoon that had people in a church membership class, and there's a whiteboard sitting on uh, the wall there, and on that whiteboard has a history, quote-unquote, of the church with a sprawling timeline and boxes that are uh, interconnected with one another, starting with the birth of Jesus and to the launch of the church at Pentecost all the way up to the modern day. And the teacher, presumably the pastor, but not necessarily finally saying, and it was here, pointing to a spot, a final spot, that is, on that whiteboard, it was here in 1954 when our church was founded that we finally got the Bible right. Even funnier, the caption of one of the others that says, Jesus is so lucky to have us. (laughs) Now, this line of belief, while we can laugh at it now, can make it awkward and difficult in certain situations with our neighbors who think and believe different things. Some of you have even asked the question in one form over another over these last few weeks during this series, essentially asking, hey, this all may be true of what we're supposed to do as neighbors, but it's hard. And what do we do about people who are just plain wrong? The people who are so detached from reality that we cannot even begin to have a conversation with them because we are on two different planes of existence. That's a great question. Social media and the internet, as we have also uh, shared over these last few weeks, have not helped our situation, especially in terms of how we talk to one another and even how we disagree with one another. Our society has implicitly stated that it has become one that doesn't necessarily believe God's word nor any word for that matter that has any kind of power. People say things like, talk is cheap, or that's just semantics, or spare me your rhetoric, or my favorite, there you go preaching at me again. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm sorry, it's an occupational hazard. (laughs) But overall, our society, what matters to it is not words, but actions especially actions that are now backed up by force. Force that is physical, force that's economic, force that's political. And it may appear that people cannot distinguish between any of those anymore. But it's in those very places where decisions that affect us all are made. And every day we look at those places and they seem to bring less and less meaning to our discourse. Less communication and more tragic, complete misunderstanding. And so as a result, people avoid conversations with their neighbors. They fear even making eye contact, especially when we see what lawn signs they have displayed. Meaningful words then are cast aside by the small din of the music we play the news that is playing constantly around the clock, machine noise that fills up the space so we don't have to engage. People don't talk anymore. And in the dark, there's a silence that's within that we get lost. Or as Simon and Garfunkel put it, that in and in the naked light I saw 10,000 people, maybe more, talking without speaking, people hearing without listening, and their words like silent raindrops fell and echoed the wells of silence. There's a lot of talk out there, but are we listening? 
if we are? What then are we to do to truly be a good neighbor? We think we're being a good neighbor by not engaging. But perhaps if we look at things a little differently, we can get some better results. See, Paul in his writing to Timothy gives us, I think, the best instruction and a couple of points to refer back to. And the first is, start with yourself. The assumption that is made in the book of Leviticus, of which is quoted of loving your neighbor as yourself, and that Jesus repeats when he is asked what the greatest commandment is, is that the people are already secure in their love of their self. How do we love our neighbors when we aren't even sure of ourselves? So that is where Paul begins with Timothy. Be true to yourself in who you are, in what you believe, and in what you teach. And when you truly have that and are truly the person that God called you to be, then that love of the self you are and in Jesus Christ will be what carries you no matter who questions you or who questions your motives. So it's with this understanding that he says in verse 17 that everyone who is proficient will be equipped for every good work. Notice, he did not say that they will be equipped with the Bible knowledge to refute any argument alone but change nobody's mind. No, instead he says that through what he knows and who they are in Jesus, they will be equipped for good works. Doing good, which is essentially at the heart of what we believe as United Methodists, to do all the good that we can. Being true to yourself and doing what is right. The next thing Paul instructs is the fact that no matter what we say or do, people, no matter what, and we've probably all encountered this, people are not going to believe or follow you. That's just a fact. Now, especially in those days, he says that Timothy will face persecution, which is also true. But regardless, to be persistent whether the time is favorable or whether the time is unfavorable, That persistence, that consistency in knowing who you are gives strength. It gives resilience in the times of trial. There are always going to be people, he says, who will look for teachers to suit their own desires and turn away from the truth and wander away to myths. Now, you could probably easily think that this letter was written for today with that, now couldn't you? But it speaks to the nature of of our humanity and why we actually need one another more and not less. To be accountable, to be humbled, and to pursue truth and love rather than abandon it for what we perceive as righteous, which usually comes at the expense of someone else. Loving our neighbors means that we know and we love ourselves enough to not be defined by the whims of our neighbors and to still be able to love them even if they do choose to follow those myths. Lastly, another instruction we get is something that, as I mentioned earlier, we do all too little of these days. Exercise patience, humility, and sober judgment. In other words, Love one another as we love ourselves. When we love ourselves and we know that love comes from God because God loved us first, it takes so much pressure off of us to convince others that we are right rather than for the truth to be revealed to them in our love. See, In chapter 4, verse 2, Paul says, Proclaim the message, be persistent, whether that time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince Rebuke and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. Patience and sober judgment is in such short supply these days, even as it was back then. So it's upon us 
not to disengage, but to allow the love that we have for each other that comes from God to be the example, to be the proof, to be the rebuke, if you will, in doing good even for those and with those whom we would otherwise probably choose not to associate with. Now this is not to say that we need to form relationships that are toxic. That leads us back into the same trap where we are not being true to who we are in faith in Jesus. But there are things that we can do, some of which is like Jesus, is still to love those who walk away from him. Be persistent in our kindness while not confusing the kindness also with weakness or speaking to the whims of others' desires just to keep the peace. Speak the truth in love. Now you may have noticed that one of the things that I tend to do is use humor. And that can be a great antidote. But it does not mean that we run away from the truth. Because it was George Bernard Shaw who was quoted as saying that my way of joking is to tell the truth. It's the funniest joke in the world, actually. If you're going to tell the truth, you better make them laugh. Otherwise, they'll kill you. <laughs> See? <laughs> Humor can take us a long way and it can even save lives, literally and figuratively, at least according to Shaw. But it also presents us with an opportunity to lower our defenses and to engage with each other in a way that can be productive rather than destructive. In the novel City of Peace, there's a story about a Methodist pastor, Harley, who is struggling to finish their sermon on forgiveness and on healing. And Harley is at a coffee shop and runs into a Baptist friend named Tanya Jones. Sharing Harley, excuse me, Harley sharing their conundrum uh, with Tanya. Tanya responds by saying, Well, do you have your Bible with you, Pastor? Tanya asked. And Harley shook his head, No. Of course not, he's a Methodist. <laughs> so Tanya says, Well, give me your phone, and quickly pulls up a, a Bible and typed in Romans 8. And Harley said, well, you know your Bible, Ms. Jones. And she says, well, it comes from being in church every Sunday. Here it is, from Romans 8. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. So Jesus saves us from that sin, said Harley, thinking aloud. And then the Spirit lives in us. And the Spirit heals wounds. That's how I understand it, Tanya agreed, handing Harley's phone back to him. I felt the Spirit, said Harley, and it has calmed me and guided me. Amen to that, Tanya said. And then Harley says, I also believe that the Spirit pulls us together. All of us. And makes us the body of Christ in the world. God breathes life into the Scriptures through the Spirit and breathes life into all of us as well. That Spirit heals us, calms us, guides us, and pulls us together as one body in Christ. You see, all of this shows us that the art of neighboring is not new. We've been working at it for a very long time. And obviously the scriptures and Jesus himself have spoken to and continue to speak to us about how we need to practice and do better. And now, especially, is not the time for us to disengage, but to truly be engaged with one another without participating in the destructiveness that the dialogue of our society continues to perpetuate today. But I will admit, it's not easy. It takes patience, it takes kindness, and a genuine love that we have for ourselves that flows from the Spirit of God that's revealed in the life of Jesus and is exemplified by all the saints who built up the community of faith that we carry on today. Now, it does not mean that we surrender what we believe. 
but to love those who would want to believe something else is so much more fruitful that through our patience and through love and through our grace, our neighbors will see themselves for who they are and see others who they are too as reflections of God's love that is made real in the image of God and is made whole through the grace of Jesus Christ and is made full through the power of the Holy Spirit. Equipped with those things, let us be a good neighbor to one another. Let us love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And as we love ourselves, then let us go and love our neighbors. There is a lot of neighboring for us to still do. Let's get about doing that. And may we love our neighbors ever more so. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, may the God who has taught us, equipped us, and guided us in faith be with us as we go forward now into the world to proclaim the good news and to share the love of God with our neighbors as we share that also among ourselves. May we go in that grace and may we go in that peace and love in Jesus' name. Amen.